Perfect. Thanks, Krista. I'm Dr. Jen Gruy, and I co-direct a research lab with my co-presenter, Dr. Chris Levin. Um, we've been running a distance research lab for undergraduate students for the past two years now, during which time we have started a total of six studies that were led by undergraduate teams. Of those studies, currently three of them have finished data collection, two have been analyzed and are being written up, another is being analyzed as we speak, and the other three are at various stages of planning and implementation. Each of these studies have been started and run to its current point completely from a distance with these undergraduate teams leading the charge in each study. We'd like to share with you today um, what we learned about doing this successfully with a focus on some of the technological tools that have helped us get where we are today. Our main lessons learned, let me advance our slides here. Our main lessons learned and tips will revolve around big questions and their three answers. The first is what are not just the goals for the research lab, like the outcomes, but what are the values of the lab? And what can you do to build that, make those, la those values um, fit in an ongoing way, regardless of the format, structure, or outcomes of the lab? The next big question is what are the obstacles that are added by going online? And then, of course, how can those obstacles be overcome? and using tools to offset them, possibly even re reframe these barriers, not as obstacles, but as simple challenges. Mountains to be climbed. Um, and lastly, how can we play to the medium? How can we make distance labs, not just labs that are doing the same thing as in-person labs, uh, but missing the in-person parts, but instead a different thing that does things that an in-person lab cannot do? things that are better in ways that they are different. And all of these things will intertwine and intersect, giving us a full view of how we have formed a successful lab that works not, just works not well just at moving forward with a new study every semester, but also at keeping these studies high in interactivity between the students and relatively low in their need for our time. So let's dig in. Now let's stop and take a look at values. Now goals and values of a lab are likely no different in an online environment and are not likely more important in a lab setting per se than in a classroom environment. However, there's a bit here to unpack. The first is that when a person is working towards something difficult, this can be framed as something that is either a problem to be hemmed and hawed about or an exciting challenge like a puzzle to be put together or a mountain to be climbed. And there is ample research to suggest that in many different domains, one distinguishing feature between kind of getting things over and done with and making them an adventure is figuring out the value about them, not just the goal. And these can be vague psychological terms, but put simply, a goal is something that can be completed, something with a final endpoint. A value is something that is ongoing. For example, you can't finish kindness because it's a value instead of a goal. So putting all this together, why on earth are we talking about values right now? Because doing research online can be a bit more difficult than doing research in person. It can be harder to stay motivated. So it becomes more important than ever to tie in as a lab why it is you're working on all these projects, not just what you'll complete, but why you'll complete it. So as a lab director or a mentor, the important part is get to the essence of what it is that you care about in having a research lab with students and ensuring that these elements shine through. Regardless of the environment in which you are working. However, the reason why it's important to notice goals when working with a distance lab is because what often happens in a research lab is that the focus becomes about the outcomes. Not about what you want the students to learn or experience, but about what you want them to have completed. And in online labs, you have different access to completion. You may not be able to complete the same projects or do so in the same timelines, but it can become really important to dig in one level deeper. What, it, what is it about um, that was important about completion of the project 
instead of the completion itself. For example, in our lab, we find values in critical thinking in the methods process itself, such as in information literacy and in giving students opportunities through growing their CVs. We find value in discussing science in and of itself, and those become the basic touchstones. In the event that studies are not completed by the time the students graduate, that's okay. Goals may not have been met, but not all is lost. And in fact, for our purposes, nothing has been lost. We have run the lab consistently, consistently with the values for our students and for our lab. And that works really well to switch from a goals mindset of checking off tasks as the success, which might be a bit more punishing in an online environment, to a situation where the process is the success. And that might sound defeating in the beginning, but it honestly is quite promising if you look deeper at the literature. Values interventions alone can increase productivity and grades drastically in school settings. And while this has only been looked at with students, the theory can hold water with faculty as well. There's reason to believe that we can be more effective and efficient if we look for what's valuable in the process instead. Another major value in our lab is hard work. For this value, I want to move on to a tangible way that we work on this value, which is the use of lab contracts. We only work with students, with undergraduate students in our lab, and there are a total of three types of undergraduate student lab members. One type of student does not need to go uh, to commit, and that type of student is the dabbler. <laughs> they are welcome to come and go into the lab, to join us in conversations in the lab, and receive mentoring. However, they cannot help with research directly, and by definition, have not committed to do so. Students have committed to do so, will have committed to either a minimum of one semester of hard work which we call a research assistant, or a minimum of one year of hard work, which we call a student investigator. Um, Chris, it looks like we have some more people waiting if you want to add them in. Get a second. And when I say that students have made a commitment, I mean that they have read our detailed contract in which we break down exactly what it is that we would expect to see from a student in these situations the ongoing behaviors that are consistent with the value of hard work. Things like timely email responses, things like taking great care to only commit to goals or tasks in a timeline that they can be confident that they can meet or exceed, and so on. These skills, as we all know, are the basic skills of successful research, but these cannot be finished, they are not goals. Hard work, then, is ultimately a value that is generally an assumed value in any research environment, one that is taken for granted. We suggest that this is no longer taken for granted, but instead stated explicitly, and that individual behaviors enacting this goal may be made explicit and be contracted as part of the lab experience. And of course, this could be made true of any core value to the lab. When moving from an in-person lab to an online lab, there are, of course, going to be obstacles. But the goal is to be purposeful here, to take the time to identify the obstacles and then to turn them into challenges to overcome, opportunities even at times, to grow in new ways and solve new problems. So first thing first, identify what is likely to be a hangup by noticing what, is, what it is in your field um, that is traditionally useful in the natural in-person environment and taking a minute to almost visualize it, to notice that it won't be there in the online environment. Thinking about these obstacles in advance, laying them out in a systematic and purposeful way will help to ensure that they both aren't surprising and aren't so overwhelming. They might be surprises still, but it's taking one step at a time and making these uh, things into challenges to overcome instead of hardships to weigh you down. 
So let's take a minute to walk through some of the obstacles and opportunities that often come up in nearly every lab when moving online. First, we have the obstacle of not having physical space. In our Department of Psychology, this can be a big deal for running things like um, research subjects. For some hard sciences, this can be an issue for things like samples and equipment. And this can be relatively challenging for some fields. But for us um, in psychology, for example, and in many of the social studies uh, sciences, we can often be successful running studies using survey software, and not just for surveys. These can be used to build out interventions, and actually with minimal HTML knowledge or interacting with HTML builder, they can build out entirely interactive websites, full with randomization. These, of course, aren't great substitutes for all types of science, but they are um, possibilities. Um, there are other possibilities, such as systematic reviews or meta-analysis, large data sets or archival research, either from public databases or potential collaborators, and potentially computer-generated simulation studies or other creative solutions specific to the field. In one interesting example, we heard of a lab that used Google Maps for a, ge a geography study. But ultimately, what you want to do is think about what matters first, about how it is that you get there and whether it's with a new technology or pre-existing data. However, because this ultimately is very specific for each lab and really each scientist, and can even be for each role statement, we can only say that the generalization is to get creative about touching back to the values of your lab. Another major obstacle is shared computers with shared software. Some of the programs that we often need for the purposes of our labs are provided in what's basically a cloud provided by our university. Many of you already likely already know about the Citrix server, but if you don't, that's a huge opportunity for how students can access many of the more expensive lab specific programs necessary to engage in things like statistical analysis. But if there are other programs that aren't available on Citrix, you can actually make your own virtual server for a relatively minimal cost using a program called LogMeIn. If you download all the software you need for the lab onto a computer with LogMeIn, and then give log, uh, lab members LogMeIn access, they will be able to access the computer from anywhere. The downside, of course, is that you need as many computers as need to be used at once. Uh, the students would literally be using that computer that they logged into just using keyboard and a mouse from a different location. So another um, major barrier is the lack of shared space for lab culture or a community. And this can make one especially, this, this can especially tie back to our values because lab culture and community can certainly make working in a lab more productive, but they aren't necessarily outcomes. Instead, they're important in and of themselves to many of us, but this can be done, uh, this can be a two-sided coin too. Uh, there's a loss in productivity with an open door policy. So having technological solutions that can be less familiar, but can also um, be more product, uh, create more productivity. Some of the solutions that we've found useful include having open Slack channels for the lab that can emulate a regular open door of a lab space where people can not only drop in to ask for help, but can also drop in to simply chat about their day. The key here is modeling and creating the community. Students will not use spaces like this simply because they exist. They will use spaces like this if they are, um, if they're used. And of course, there are video conferences, 
the primary reason that Zoom was the most popular video conference app during isolation was due to the fact that it allowed the viewing of many faces at once, which was not available on most competitor applications. And this is really important feature of lab meetings. While some video conference software applications are catching up, this is a feature you want to be sure to include for lab or your large group meetings. So once the values of the lab are developed, then the next major question to ask when developing a distance lab is what can you do or what can you offer in a distance lab that an in-person lab can't do? Because if we simply took the most productive lab in most fields or most department and kind of plopped it online and then tried to just find tools to do whatever they were already doing to make them emulate the same things, they're just gonna be less good labs. And that's exactly what we're finding when we look at a lot of people who are kind of worried about online classes coming up this semester. When you take classes and don't modify them for the medium, but instead just plop the in-person experience into the online modality, then what you have is a subpar learning experience to what you had in person. But the mistake is to just stay in that rut, to stick to what's comfortable instead of what fits what you're actually doing. Teaching online can be really great. And in fact, there's an entire literature of how to improve it and how to do a better fit for teaching this way. And it can stray pretty majorly from in-person teaching. And doing research online can be really great too. But in our experience and from some lessons learned, we expect that it too is just not great if it's done the same as you try to do it in person. If you try to emulate that same experience. The key instead is to figure out how to use the amazing set of distance tools to your advantage to figure out this whole distance opportunity of having the whole world of technology as this backdrop instead of just a brick and mortar setting and to build this amazing lab that plays to those tools. A lab that doesn't try to be what it's not, but instead tries to thrive at exactly what it is. A lab that plays to that medium. In other words, when moving research online, attend to things that distance is great for, that online learning or online research is great at doing, and focus the efforts there. It's like how in web-based therapy literature, we learned really quickly that if you tried to make like an artificially intelligent counselor that tried to like validate you and speak to you, it was really bad. Um, and it certainly is not what technology is good at in this domain. But if instead you tried to gamify a self-help website that taught psychoeducation and it tried to tailor different information for different people after like they filled out a survey, those have really great outcomes because a human counselor is really, really good at being a human counselor. But a computer-generated psychoeducation website is really great at gamification and at teaching in a scalable way. That's what we mean when we say play to the medium. Figure out what you can be great at doing in this way and what can be done better online that fits with your goals and with your values and put your efforts there. Next slide, Jen. In our lab, one study we're currently working on, for example, is testing potential gender bias in student evaluations. When we were exploring the extant literature, we were noticing that we couldn't find any studies that controlled for all of the many potential confounds in teaching over a semester. All the gender bias evaluation studies seem to be based on an entire semester's worth of teaching. They seem to be given at the end of the semester when students are often evaluating based off of issues related not only to teaching, but also to their own grades, to their own stress in the class, for example, to these things that were not controlled between conditions. So how can we now play to the medium as an example? Well, one of the very best things that all of us can do while setting up online labs when playing to the medium is that we have this toolbox of web-based studies that have really tight control. Participants who go through a platform like Qualtrics, for example, they're going to get the exact same study experience, even when we're looking at randomized experiments. And if we're looking at a teaching uh, example through this tightly controlled online lecture, 
we have the same thing. We can pre-record online lectures. We can give the exact same instructions. We can write up a script that's exactly the same for male and female voices. We can have the same blips. We can even look down to the level of millisecond pauses if we care to. An online teaching module is exactly the same when played the first time and the 20th time. And an online teaching module can be controlled to have the exact same visuals, the same attempt, the same animated narration and voiceover in lecture between an audio lecture over a visual heavy presentation. And this type of control would not be possible in person, but is fully possible in our medium. And we can vary it over different times of the semester. So we can have that kind of control between different things. So we're playing to the medium. We found a research question and then not only looked at how we could answer it, but how we could answer it better in an online lab than we could if we had tried to do it in person in ways that it had been done so far. Next slide. Now looking at another way that we both play to the medium and work towards our values using a very tangible example that you all can take home to your own labs in using an example of lessons learned. In our first year in the lab, we found that we were doing the same things over and over again with different students and different cohorts of student studies. We were sending them the same sets of emails, same basic information, answering the same questions in lab. And in one really big lesson learned, an entire study was set off course for several weeks because I forgot to send one student the information she needed to complete her IRB ethics cert certification in time to submit the IRB proposal. And this is a really silly way to spend time and a really silly reason to get behind. So not long after, we spent some time looking for the best way to play to the medium in how we could get students to work hard and meet their commitments while reserving our personal time for tasks that only we could do, such as individual mentoring, aiding in critical thinking, and saving for questions that aren't so repeatable or predictable between different studies. So what we ended up with was using, of course, software to do part of our mentoring using a project management system called ClickUp, which has both a free and a paid version, but so far we've been using even only the free version. The specific feature that we liked about this project management system was that it uses templates that you build once and then you can just assign new templates to new projects. So we were able to make two key templates that we have been able to use over and over to play to the medium of our values of hard work that have aided in making our distance lab a success, allowing our time to be spent on things that aren't repeatable and aren't predictable. And while this might be useful for really any lab, this is especially useful for an online setting where studies have found that at least in online teaching, students need a little bit more structure and more information to stay active and motivated. And we've made the logical leap to assume that this would hold true for distance labs as well. So let's take a look at that now. Next slide, Jen. The first template is for the research assistants, which in our lab are those students who have committed to just the one semester. This entails writing a lit review on that semester's topic. This template walks them through every predictable goal and measurable outcome for the typical RA semester. And it does so in a project management style. It has reminders, it has checklists, and RAs in our lab, for example, are asked to do lit searches and then submit drafts in both a draft and a final throughout the semester. The ClickUp template guides them through almost as though it's like a set it and forget it classroom for all of the repeatable tutorials and tasks. It teaches them how to do a lit search. It teaches them how to answer questions about plagiarism and about giving appropriate credit. It ensures that there are no questions. They understand the difference between like a peer reviewed journal and all the other types of sources since we require that they only use peer review. It teaches them how to contact the psychology librarian. These were all frequently asked questions before that we were spending a lot of time on in our lab meetings, setting up extra meetings about. We don't have to spend that time anymore. Instead, we can, instead, we can spend time talking about the content of that semester's lit review, thinking about what hypotheses we can grow from this content, how we can make a research question that works best from an online platform, and so on. Next slide, Jen. 
As for our student investigators, which are the students who have committed to a minimum of one year, and those students work in teams to complete a study from start to finish, we have a similar, but of course, far more advanced checklist. So no student can ever again forget to complete something that will hold up a project unless they're simply just not holding up to their commitments or staying up to date on their ClickUp management software. And for student investigators, we start to see dependencies where they can't start one thing unless something else is finished, but they can still see it. And that's kind of key that I'll get to in a second. For example, they start to see that the appropriate time to start looking at data analysis is not until they close down the recruitment. And while all of us here kind of already know this, this comes as a surprise to a lot of undergraduate students who want to be looking at the data as it comes in. But again, instead of telling each individual student that, we can use this structure that online teaching really sometimes requires. So it says, uh, that for each and every one of them, they don't have to ask us individually. And once they check off that recruitment, that they've finished recruiting all of their subjects, a whole section then opens up about what to do next. It doesn't prohibit them from working with us, and it's actually on the contrary. We're working with them closely at all steps and meeting regularly. However, it saves hours and hours of tacking on meetings about and writing emails to each student uh, or group of students each semester about what to do when this portion is complete or simply just during the time of the year that they should start thinking about this or submitting to that conference. These are all automatic and built in. So the easy and rote portion is taken care of and we can focus on the personal portions and those that are specific to individual studies and individual students. And each student feels far more in control and prepared about what to do next because it's all lined up and prepared for them, ready and waiting that they can look ahead instead of remaining curious, or they can wait to be prompted. Students have information and control at their fingertips, which is huge for a setting where students might be lacking in these things if we offer them the same kinds of layouts as in traditional labs. And this is a way to play to the online medium, as well as playing to multiple values at once, including hard work and working towards building one CV. Next slide, Jen. And one final note on playing to the medium and to values at the same time is something that's uh, especially different now during COVID than it was just even a year ago. And that's the kind of makeup of distance students more generally and the inclusion and equity considerations that, we can, that can come with that. Ultimately, there's uh, both logic and some data to suggest that COVID has been both a great equalizer in some ways and a great divider in others to different demographics of students. For example, we've seen some division in the sense of multiple reports, especially in the K through 12 arena, arena of uh, widening the learning gap due to varying internet speeds, for example, that don't allow things like the use of webcams. And for issues such as having private places to study in multi-generational houses, for example. There's reason to believe that this would translate to higher education as well. In fact, a study we ran last semester, we found that having more individuals living in a home than there are bedroom doors that closed was a predictor of having grades reduced from spring break to the end of the semester. On the other hand, um, distant students previously tended to come from backgrounds of lower socioeconomic status. They tended to have higher rates of disability, were more likely to be veterans, and had notably higher rates of having, uh, sorry, uh, hey, and we're talking about it now, the, the issues with living at home. So there goes my doorbell and my dogs are off to the races. Um, anyway, they were more likely to be veterans and they had notably higher rates of having families while in school. Uh, but since COVID, these distinctions just seem to have largely disappeared, as in um, like the springtime, functionally all colleges and universities went online. And this fall, it's simply far more common to the point that logically it would be likely to lose some of this distinction between demographic groups. And these students have actually had a different set of opportunities too. Um, our, our distant students. Many of our students who would not have been able to travel for various reasons have been able to present at regional conferences this last spring, but only because those conferences were made virtual. So it's been equalizing many things every bit as much as it's created some new distances.
However, we, as we've rounded this corner of uh, just recently past the 30th anniversary of Americans with Disabilities Act, and as we continue to see that many disabilities are able to work generally, but are unable to work outside of their homes, it's worth noting some very important technology choice points when engaging in an online lab and how they may affect, for example, individuals with disabilities, but also how we can play to the medium to be flexible towards the value of inclusion in a way that we would not be able to in in-person labs. The first example of this is simply me. I, Chris Eleven, am a person with a disability, and I would not be physically able to run a traditional research lab, let alone engage in one. In fact, this is why our lab has been distanced as long as it has been, because I'm not able to sit up in a professional setting, um, at least not all the time. And in fact, sometimes I'm not able to sit up in a professional manner as I am now. Sometimes I have to turn off my webcam so that I can lie down during our lab meetings. Next slide, Jen. Continuing on this theme of playing to the medium with inclusion, in our case, there are many, many ways in which it comes up, many of which a lot of people, probably a lot of you, saw for the first time only this last year. In our lab, which um, last semester had 13 students, we had a total of seven mothers and one soon-to-be mother. Um, all of those mothers were stay-at-home except for one, um, and they were engaged in the distance lab because they needed to be in a situation where they could be with their children while engaging in their, in their coursework. And this was long before COVID. This uh, begged the question, were children allowed to sit on their parents' laps during meeting? What uh, were the boundaries of child care? And in fact, in one memorable lab meeting, we had a muted diaper change on camera. Um, we certainly have found that um, looking at the goals and values of our own lab, allowing more flexibility in our lab members' schedules allowed them to be more productive. And in fact, it increased productivity just as it does for the two of us, the co-directors of the lab, one of whom is a mother and the other whom is a has a disability um, and who does sometimes need non-traditional working conditions in order to be productive. But this is always in aid of the values of hard work and looking towards the goals of the studies in our lab. So as we move towards this new world where all of us have all ranges of people and households colliding into the choices we make about how to get research done and what we're going to do um, in building up our labs and our courses, we certainly will not make suggestions as to what decisions should be made for any given lab. We can only imagine that there are some labs in which it would be necessary for cameras to be on, for example, or labs in which it simply wouldn't work to have a baby on a lap. However, it's worth noting, I think, that it might mean leaving some people behind. But what we will suggest for every lab is that decisions regarding the guidelines for technology might be based on values and objectives for what you want to get done and why you want to get it done instead of based on assumptions. Especially this confusing and strange circumstance where we all have this great opportunity to kind of allow for this extra inclusion and to invite people to this research party that might not have otherwise been able to join. People like me, actually. And as things shift and change in the future, it might be something to consider if it works for your lab, whether it's possible to keep on inviting those people to the party. People who may not be able to come to campus even in the future for various reasons. Next slide, Jen. So to summarize, developing a successful distance research lab is all about figuring out what it is that we can do better online than in person and letting go of all the things that we simply can't do as well. That's ultimately the largest and most important tenet to what we believe makes our lab successful and the rest simply builds to, on this. We'll never replace in-person labs, but that doesn't mean that we have to be subpar to them. Instead, we can use the values and goals as a touchstone. Notice that the challenges and think about how to purposely overcome them thoughtfully and creatively, and then simply play to the medium instead of trying to do what the in-persons were doing. We can develop these labs to be totally different types of labs because both types of labs do what they do very well, and both focus on purposeful goals and values. And it's our belief that once we as an academic community get used to the obstacles of distance research and distance learning,
and find the bright spots of this online medium, that obstacle of in-person teaching may become just as apparent as online obstacles are now. And the bright spots of distance research will shine far more brightly than they do now. And more and more people will work out the kinks to see the flexible and diverse world that we have seen it afford. Next slide. So that's it for our presentation. Thank you.